coming up, the mad Jedi voodoo of talk to yield bolts. The fat cave physics. Yes. Everything you have always wanted to know about talk to yield, but been too terrified to ask. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. You can inquire at the website about that, but not today because we've got some important bolts demystifying to do. This question, which trickles through periodically, I get quite a bit of it from people you know, asking about whether they should actually replace those head bolts or not, comes from a guy named... Peter Allen, who says, I enjoy your channel and wonder if you would like to sink your teeth into an engineering question that I can't get my head around. I notice that a lot of bolts on modern engines, head bolts, etc., specify that you give them a particular torque setting and then you add X number of degrees of rotation after that torque has been reached. Surely, once you add the X degrees to the original torque value, you would end up at a new higher torque value than the original. So why not just give that final value and be done with it rather than complicating the matter? I am guessing that it may only apply to the single-use torque to yield bolts. However, I still don't understand the reason. And if it is relevant, what's the deal with torque to yield bolts anyway? Quite a bit to unpack here, okay? So I'd suggest we start by going back to basics and saying, well, what is a bolt? And I'd suggest it's really just a clamping device, okay? And you put a workpiece in between the two washers in this case, and when you do the nut up, obviously you wind it up onto the workpiece, it stretches the bolt, which in this case, pretty serious bolt. It's a M24 grade 8.8 high tensile bolt. So, you know, if you needed to, you could beat a zombie to death with this, I'd suggest. Although I hope it doesn't come to that, but you could. And, you know, when you've got a particular amount of stretch in the bolt, you've got a particular amount of clamping forces between the washers, and that's kind of nice because it holds your cylinder head onto the block, or it holds the rod end cap onto the con rod, or it holds the crank into the block via the big end cap or something of that nature. So that's the theory. You, if you're an engineer and you're just designing bolted joints, all you do is you pick the right grade of bolt to deliver reliably the clamping force you need without breaking the bolt or causing it to fatigue in service or something of that nature. And th- that works pretty well, right? Because cylinder head bolts rarely fail in service and big end bearing caps rarely fail. Con rods rarely fail, at least the bolted joints of con rods rarely fail when you consider the millions of engines that will start up at any particular hour of any particular day around the globe. It's all pretty reliable. So something's going right out there, isn't it? And there's a few different ways you can tighten these babies up, isn't there? Right? You can just do them by feel. You can use mad Jedi tricks. You know, you can channel the force or something and just get your hands on a spanner and go, "Mm, I think that's about right. And a lot of people will tell you that they can do that quite reliably and perhaps they can, but generally it's bullshit and certainly not as good as a torque wrench. Okay, now this is a baby torque wrench, obviously, because I didn't want to wield the three foot one in here, but. It's a quarter inch drive, the kind of thing you'd use for talking up things on bicycles and devices of that nature. Not too much automotive work requiring a quarter inch torque wrench, but there you go. It's got a vernier scale down this end. You might be able to see that. I'm not so sure, but let's see. Anyway, if you can't, I'll fix that in post, as they say, but you just tighten it up to the required torque. And then when you're tightening the job, all that happens is you hear a click and the head sort of disengages briefly and you know that you're at that torque. And you might think, and certainly a lot of mechanics do think this, that their torque wrench is a lightsaber. (laughs) philosophically at least, but its accurate, its accuracy is actually not that good and it's got nothing to do with the accuracy of the torque wrench and everything to do with the nature of the fastener itself, okay? When you look at the torque, what you're doing is the torque correlates to a particular amount of stretch in the bolt which delivers a particular amount of clamping force and that would be fine if you could standardise the operating environment of the bolt. But in practice, 
a great deal of that talk, up to 90% in some cases, a great deal of that talk is devoted just to overcoming friction, right? Overcoming the friction that builds up between the mating faces of the thread on the set screw and the cylinder head or the nut, whatever, you know, if it's a bolted joint, if it's a set screw going down into a head, you know, and also but under the head of the bolt itself onto the piece that's being clamped. There's a great deal of friction and most of that torque is aimed at overcoming the friction and only some number like 20 or even less percent of that torque stretches the bolt. So in an environment that's really hard to standardise, like the threads could be heavily lubricated or they could be lightly lubricated, they could just have a bit of mill scale on them like these ones do, they could be heavily corroded and the job, you know, the piece that you're putting a set screw or a bolt down into, like uh, into the cylinder block itself, could have residual thread sealing compound from the last time the engine was rebuilt sort of thing. So it's very difficult to dial in with precision the amount of friction that the torque wrench has to work against. So torque wrench, not that ideal. Now, the thing Peter talked about, he actually talked about two things, torque to yield and angle tightening. And they're different things, right? A torque to yield bolt is a product. It is a fastener designed to do a particular thing, which we'll get to in just a second, okay? But the angle tightening thing is a way of ensuring you get to the required tension that sort of takes friction out of the equation. So it's a technique. Torque to yield is a kind of fastener. Angle tightening is a technique and not particularly new either. It's been used in industry for ages. So when you look at a bolt, you've got your basic bolt like that. You know what the pitch of the thread is, which is the distance between the adjacent peaks on the thread or the adjacent valleys, right? And therefore, you know that a particular angle of rotation of the nut or the bolt gives you a particular amount of travel but along the shank because you know how, you know, one turn, 360 degrees of rotation equals the distance between the peaks, right? And 180 degrees, half a peak, 90 degrees is a quarter of a peak. So you can dial in the amount of stretch. And what you do in this case is there's a specification like this for commonly for things like head bolts, which are probably M10 sort of bolts or something, then you would go down and torque the bolts using a torque wrench to a light setting like 20 newton metres or something of that nature, which if you live in America or any one of those other imperial lil kind of countries is about 15 foot pounds, which is not very heavy, but it's enough to take any play out of the system and get the mating faces engaged with one another. Okay, And there's not very much friction at 20 newton metres because the friction is proportional to the amount of tension in the bolt. The more tension there is there clamping the thing down, the harder it is to move the head and the face of the nut and the threads against one another. Okay, So 20 newton metres, not that much friction, reasonably accurate. You take the play out and you get to all the parts being bound up together nice and closely like that. And then maybe the spec says you go... 90 degrees and 90 degrees equals stretch equivalent to a quarter of the pitch of the thread equals whatever elongation of the bolt equals whatever tension is required to keep the bits together reliably. So that's always nice when that happens and it's far more accurate than a torque wrench because friction is effectively sidelined. You're looking at mechanical travel of the nut down the bolt or the bolt into the job, whatever. And it could be harder to achieve that 90 degrees or whatever angle you need. Or it could be easier if the parts are lubricated, whatever. But it's going to be the same amount of stretch, which is ultimately what you're after here, right? So if you think that's the ultimate, I've got news for you. There are better ways of doing this as well. You can have load indicating washers. These are used commonly in bolted joints like structural bolted joints in industry, putting bridges together and things of that nature. What there is is a tightly controlled 
washer with specific dimples pressed into the face and you tighten the bolt down to a particular angle and then you confirm the amount of compression with a feeler gauge. Like you started with this much gap between the nut and the washer or something and then you compress those dimples and it went down to this much. You stick a feeler gauge in there and it's a very accurate measurement of the stretch in the system, right, because of the compression of the washer. And that's fine, except you don't always have physical access to the side for a feeler gauge, and you generally don't have that in automotive terms around things like cylinder head bolts. So not very practical in that case. You can also directly measure fastener elongation. If you can get to both ends of the fastener, which incidentally you cannot do with a head bolt because this end of the thread is way down there in the block, but if you can get to both ends, then you can use a device as simple as a micrometer to physically measure the elongation. And you can do that with rod bolts. Okay, so you can physically measure them and physical measurement is amazingly accurate, right? If you can do it. The uh, other thing you could do, and we're really talking NASA here, okay, or Large Hadron Collider or things of that nature, you know, scientific this and that, aerospace this and that. You can actually embed strain gauges. They actually grind and glue them onto the piece and then they have to be calibrated which is a pain in the ass and sort of a big job and you need lots of specialised equipment to measure the elongation with a strain gauge. It's not very straightforward, but you can use a strain gauge to do it as well. So that would be the lexicon of ways to tighten bolts precisely, okay? And I hope that gives you some insight into the way, you know, various engineering executions take place. You might use strain gauges in environments like Sending a spacecraft to Mars where every gram counts and you've got to make the bolts so efficient. They've got to be contributing all they can do because if it's one gram heavier than it should be, that's a pain in the ass and you need, you know, kilos more fuel to get it up into orbit or whatever. Okay, but this is not the case with cars. We're just rebuilding engines here, which is not exactly rocket science. So torque wrenches do a fine job angle tightening is more precise, all right? So finally, I guess, let us talk about torque to yield bolts, which this is not, but, you know, representatively, they look pretty much the same and they're just designed to function a little differently. So let's talk about yield because yielding is one of those things that every engineer and metallurgist understands, but hardly anyone else does. And it's kind of therapeutic, I think, to learn how to break something made out of steel. The physics of breaking shit, it's always uplifting on lockdown, isn't it? Okay, so basically this is the guidebook about how to break anything made of steel. When you break a piece of steel, this is a graph and it's strain across here and stress up here and all of a sudden everyone's going, oh, Jesus, stress and strain, what's that? Just think about it like stretch and load because that's basically what it is. And I know if you've been through the education mill as I have and uh, had your brain bleeding several times already, you'll know that it's not really stretch and load. Stress and strain are slightly different than that. But for everyone else, they're tantamount to that, okay? So when you break a piece of steel, this is the road that it drives along on the way to failure. And there are several interesting waypoints programmed into the GPS. <laughs> Yes. The first bit of straight road here is the elastic region of the behaviour of steel. Now, obviously, when you get anything made out of steel, you bend it a little bit, you know, you can t twist it in torsion, you can bend it like this, you can compress it, you can stretch it, it doesn't matter. If you're in the elastic zone, it always returns to its original size and shape. And obviously, there's a point at which that no longer pertains. And you can play around with an old coat hanger or something and bend it gently and it'll spring back. And then when you bend it and when you bend it a little bit further, you get into this zone of banana ramorization. okay? <laughs> you can do that to your ute chassis. We'll talk about that later in the week. But banana ramorization is a thing. Okay, and basically this is the yield point. Okay, they call it the 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 gateway to banana armorization is marked by the yield point, which is also called the elastic limit of the material. And after you get 
across the border and into this region from elastic to this region. This is plastic behaviour of the material, right? And all that means is some of the deformation is going to stay with the material. You're going to bend it, it's going to be permanent, all right? And you'll notice that there's a slight little notch here. Don't worry about that so much. M many materials don't experience much of a notch at all. They just go from elastic to plastic, right? And then the, the load keeps going and going and going. Load keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. And you get to this point here, the ultimate tensile strength. <laughs> yes. And if you've ever broken off a bolt in a head or any of that kind of thing, you will know what this feels like because you get to the point you're tightening and tightening and tightening and the load's going on and on and on and you're going yes just a little bit more and then the load comes off a bit this is the oh shit point <laughs> you go oh shit because you know what's about to happen obviously if the load remains the same at this point the de the uh, deformation of the material continues unabated and it catastrophically fails at this point, right? And you felt this because you're tightening and tightening and tightening and tightening and then all of a sudden it just gets softer and breaks. And that's that bit here, getting softer and breaking. So you felt this, you've been on this road, you've broken the shit out of something important, at least now you know the topography. All right, so with all of that in mind, oh, incidentally, if you banana ramify your ute, you end up here, somewhere here. Some of this deformation is permanent. You don't break the ute in half, although you could. That'd be entertaining, wouldn't it? But generally, you end up somewhere along the road here, stranded with a ute shaped like a banana. Yes! And we'll talk about that during the week. However, we're not here at the moment. What we're doing essentially with torque to yield bolts is we're going to about here, okay? Generally, well, I should run through this in some detail so you get it, okay? If you're dealing with a normal bolt like this, like a high tensile bolt, one that would have been used for donkey's ears in various engines, then it kind of works like this. And I've got the numbers here, like a grade uh, 10.9, which is the next spec up from this one. This is 8.8, .8, there's 10.9, there's another one above 10.9, which I can never remember. But basically... When you get to here, you're at 60.3 kilonewtons, okay? It's going to break at 60 kilonewtons. And if you're going, oh, Jesus, a kilonewton. A kilonewton's about 100 kilos. It's actually 98.1 kilos, right? But just call it 100 for the sake of, you know, we're building engines here. So that's about 100 kilos, 60 lots of 100 kilos, which is about six tonnes for an M10 bolt. And if you're in America, that's about three-eighths of an inch, okay? High tensile bolt. It'll break at about six tonnes of clamping force. But the yield point is going to be about five and a half tonnes for a bolt like that. And they have this thing called a proof load, which is a test, that just to make sure that the bolt is strong enough. And the proof load is like 48, so it's over here somewhere. And the assembly torque, which they specify in the manual for these things, is about here. It's at like 31 kilonewtons, which is like three tonnes. So these are very conservatively loaded components, right? Three tonnes worth of assembly for six tonnes worth of here, it's going to fail, all right? And that's why they don't break very often because they're so conservatively tightened. Incidentally, it's going to be about 63 newton metres, which is about 46 or 47 foot-pounds, I think, right, for a M10 grade 10.9 at the assembly torque operating about here. So obviously with torque to yield, what happens is there's a higher torque spec for the material. You end up past the yield point and on the road to ultimate tensile strength and you stop here. And there's so much bullshit online about why this is so. They talk about greater consistency and clamping forces and all that stuff. The main reason for torque to yield is that you can get greater clamping force out of the fasteners. So you can use smaller fasteners to do the same job or you can use fewer fasteners of the same size to do the same job. And this is important because in things like cylinder heads, there's not a lot of spare real estate, you know. Real estate's at a premium in a cylinder head because you've got to have mechanical clamping locations and you've got to get air in and you've got to get exhaust out. You've got to have a fuel injector in there. You've got to have mounting posts for the various components such as 
camshafts, that's kind of important and you've got to have valve guides in there and you've got to have water and oil as well. Like there's a lot going on in a cylinder head. I know it looks boring from outside, but actually designing one is like playing three-dimensional chess in the dark. So if you can get away with a slightly smaller cylinder head using slightly smaller fasteners doing the same job, like boys' fasteners doing a man's job or something, then that's a victory for design. I think you'd agree. Right, so importantly... Two things flow on from this talk to yield business, okay? When you get something on the road to Plastic City here and Ultimate Tensile Strength, when you unload it, it unloads elastically, but it does not return to the same shape. So if you bend it, it stays bent. Your ute <laughs> will remain banana ramified. Your bolt will be stretched okay, permanently stretched. And that's kind of bad. Not only does the deformation remain permanent, but the material properties change because the various crystals in the steel have been stretched and they move relative to one another permanently. And that's why you shouldn't use the fasteners again, which I guess is the main problem with talk to yield bolts, which is that once you undo something, you've got to throw those bolts away and go again with brand new ones. Otherwise, it's kind of irresponsible. Okay. So that would never work. For example, with wheel studs. What a pain in the ass! Every time you service the car, you need, you know, 20, 24, whatever, new wheel studs. Not going to happen, right? It's for these components that hardly ever get undone, you know, like cylinder head bolts or big end bolts or rod bolts or things of that nature, all right? That's why they do that. And the other problem is it's not that difficult to do the angle tightening thing okay, but you do need an angle tightening gauge because you don't want to estimate 80 degrees or 65 or whatever. You want to measure it and you can buy one of those things. It's not that bad, but it adds a layer of complexity. And unless you are a bit of a Jedi on the tools, the harder you make anything, the more, the more susceptible it becomes to failure, okay? Like complexity is the enemy of reliability. And this is just as true of machines as it is for servicing and assembly protocols. If you make assembly more complex, there will be more mistakes made intrinsically doing it. And therefore, you know, they're kind of expensive mistakes too, aren't they? When one of those rod bolts just doesn't get done up properly, it typically doesn't end well. All right. So if you're working in an engine assembly shop using angle tightening, you'd want to be pretty good at it. You'd know the uh, implications of getting it wrong. But if you're just some dude doing it at home, he's doing it for the first time, trying to get it right, you're halfway through and the phone rings, that's bad. It's always bad when a distraction just takes you over there mentally and then you come back and you go, oh, yeah, I've done that one or whatever. Okay, so I hope this has given you some appreciation for all the different tools in the engineering toolkit for dialing in the tension in these babies, which is quite important if you want machines to operate reliably. And also some delightful scenic tips on the road to banana ramification, which we will talk about during the week in respect of bending yo ute out there in the outback, which is quite entertaining as long as it doesn't happen to your ute. I think you'd agree. Thank you very much for watching. Fuck you very much, 2020. And as your next prime mincer, I didn't have time to put the hat in place today, but I'll say it anyway. Let's do all we can to make Australia less shit. 